Welcome, welcome, patrons. The finale of the newest run of Dragon Age comics is here, and I'm pretty excited and honestly a, a little sad to get into it. So let's just jump into Dragon Age Dark Fortress. Issue 1. Outside of Nero Median, our heroes are camped out on their journey, with Sir Aaron having nightmares about his time in Ostagar. He starts to reach for his alcohol canteen before Vaya, who has been keeping watch, asks if he wants to talk about what's troubling him. The others awaken by a fire chat, and we get a quick recap on the group dynamics. Sir Aaron is troubled by his past. Vaya sees him as a father. Francesca just lost hers. Barius doesn't like to talk, and Fenris is still sarcastic, but starting to reach out to the others as a friend. Autumn is still a good girl, and Tessa is... there. We cut to Castillum Tenebris, and we meet the Denarius heir Tractus. He is a bastard to the Denarius line, but recently got recognized as part of the family, as thanks to Fenris, the line was no more. He has been working with our cast of villains in their quest to use the mysterious sarcophagus. The trio talk about the plan in which they will use it along with the sword created by the idol to transform Shiralis into a powerful being. In the talk, it's clear that Nanelius considers himself the leader, and the others are merely pawns in his quest to create a super soldier against the Canari and regain lands lost to the Imperium. In the city of Neromenium proper, Fenris explains that this is where Daenerys' house used to be supplied. There used to be a secret entrance into the castle as the main gates were behind a lone bridge, but he knows that it was sealed up years ago. Whether well, surely another, he does not know it. So here they are trying to find someone who would know, likely an old servant. While Tessa hunts down a lead, the others wait in a tavern. Sir Aaron is notably upset and drinking again. Francesca wonders if Vaya should say something, but Vaya responds that it has to be his choice to stop drinking. She then changes the subject to the other woman and asks how she's handling killing her own father. Francesca isn't sure, but asks how Vaya handles taking a life, to which she admits that she never has. They ask Marius if killing gets easier, to which she says, yes. Fenris notes that killing being easy is worse, and eyes wander to Sir Aaron. However, Fenris objects that it's not what bothers him. He recognizes the look on his face. It's one that he saw in Hawk after their mother was murdered. It's the look of someone haunted by failure. Tessa comes back then, saying that she has found the Daenerys, which shocks Fenris as he thought he had killed the line completely. She has found the bastard heir at another tavern in the wealthy side of town. Fenris begins to leave, saying that he will end the line a second time, but Vaya objects. They need him alive to tell them where the passage is. We cut to later in the day, where a drunk Tractus is yelling at a bartender for cutting him off. He tells his Venatori guards to kill Nanelius if they see him, to which we are clued in that Sir Aaron and Marius has taken their place. When he gets into his room, Vaya, Fenris, and Autumn jump Tractus, who recognizes the Blue Wraith as his father's killer. His magic is no match for Fenris' abilities, who then headbutts him to the ground, saying that his death was justice, and Vaya and Autumn has to stop him from killing the heir. Outside, the Kanari have arrived, and Telsey yells that they need to get their answers and leave. Fenris uses his abilities to get information about the secret entrance, to which we learn that it only opens from the inside. The group then leaves, leaving Tractus tied to a chair for the Kanari. We then cut to the Kanari who kill a father running with his child. A Karistan picking up the poor boy to be re-educated into a Canari. Another soldier tells the leader of Tractus, who has told them of a plan to create a super soldier against them. The Karistan then tells his men to depart, as they will head to this dark fortress to stop the ritual and kill all they encounter. Issue 2. We open back up with Karistan, who learns that Tractus has escaped, but it doesn't really matter. They will take down the ritual. We cut to the bridge of the fortress, and Vaya is making her way across the bottom of the bridge that is not to be seen. Fenris wonders if this is what Ferald and Squires learned in their training, but Sir Aaron notes that she taught herself these skills. He then says that they should wait near the opening so they can meet Vaya when she arrives. In the forest, the group wonders where she is, as it's been a while. Sir Aaron taking a swig in worry. Suddenly, it opens, and out pops Vaya, much to the joy of Autumn and Sir Aaron. Inside the passage, the group asks Fenris how his ritual went, to which she admits he doesn't actually remember much. They had locked him into a sarcophagus, placed a sword laced with lyrium in it, and it began, carving the lyrium into him. Marius wonders if he can stop Nanelius from casting his magic for the ritual, but Fenris notes that the information they got from Tractus implies that he won't be doing that much casting. Meanwhile, Vaya asks why Sir Aaron has been dreaming of Ostagar recently. He says that Fenris' suggestion was close, but he is haunted by the impact of his choices. He had obeyed orders from Loghain and went to find Kaelin and ensure his safety, but it didn't matter. He didn't make it in time, and watched his king die. His choices didn't matter. It didn't make any difference. While he was at the lands meet in the final battle, it didn't matter. That was someone else's battle. 
he began to wonder if anything he had done mattered. That's why he began to travel around and tell his stories. Maybe he could inspire others to make a change that mattered. But instead, all he did was inspire Olivia to get herself killed. And in his heart, he knows he cannot break his own habits. Vaya tells him that maybe he cannot save the world, or a king, or maybe even a canary invasion, but is that the only way to measure a life? He had been able to help Vaya, and as a group, they were able to help Fantesca, and she was able to help them get in contact with Fenris. Speaking of Fenris, he butts in then to get back into the mission, but Sir Aaron tosses his canteen away for the final time. The group then reaches the courtyard to find that the Venatori have captured a dragon! Neat! Back to our villains, the professor shows Nanelius the weapon to be used in the ritual, a red lyrium sword that the idol had made. Nanelius wonders if it will be enough red lyrium, but the professor notes that unlike the arcane warrior swords that they used in previous rituals, this one should survive. Nanelius then wonders if they should use the idol, but the professor notes that the deal was that he could study it after the experiment was over. Cutting back to our heroes, they begin to hear strange noises. The Canari are shooting off rockets into the fortress. They are here. The Venatori start to begin their ritual, and our heroes begin to form a plan. They are suggesting freeing the dragon by herself, but Fenris isn't having it, and upon Sir Aaron's suggestion, goes along with her and Autumn. Sir Aaron and Marius then confront the Professor and Anelius, while Francesca tries to stop Shiralis going into the sarcophagus. However, she is knocked back by a blast from the Canary Rockets, and the ritual is complete. Issue 3 we open up with a very quick and dirty rundown on Shiralis' backstory. As a child, his clan was wiped out and lived alone for some time. He was eventually taken in and given his Valisline by another clan, to which he took the markings of Elgonon, God of Vengeance. He then joins Fenris in his desire for vengeance for his family. After that, he is trained by Nanelius to gain power. Back to the present, Nanelius mocks Marius for trying to fight when the Venatori have so much power, with the Professor looking a bit uneasy about this all. Meanwhile, Shiralis picks up the red lyrium sword and it reforms in his hands. Francesca uses her ability to kill more of the Venatori on vines, while Fenner starts to rush out of the castle, Vaya chasing him and asking where he is going. Out at the front of the castle, the Canaria are surprised that the walls are still holding, but then suddenly the gates start to open, and Fenner yells out in Cunlot that they must talk. Back to the courtyard, Tessa is soloing a dragon while Marius fights an Anelius, and Sir Aaron and Francesca take on Shiralis. Suddenly, the Canari start to kill off Venatori soldiers. They have entered the castle. Fenris interrupts Sir Aaron's fight, telling him to focus on the dragon. He will take on Shialis. Fenris is able to impale the Red Wraith, and Francesca topples a pillar on top of him, along with grabbing the dragon with her vines. With a moment of peace, Vea finds Tessa yelling at Marius. He wants to kill Nanelius, but she's worried he will be killed instead. But together, they believe they can take him down. Marius then confronts Nanelius, but before Tessa is able to make her move, the pile of rubble she is standing next to explodes. The Red Wraith has healed and is back on the battlefield. Marius is able to rip away Nanelius' sword, taking away his focus, but the older man mocks his former pupil, that he doesn't need a focus to cast. Before he is able to make a killing blow on Marius, Vea jumps in and stabs him in the neck, taking Tessa's place. Despite the victim, Vea is horrified at her first kill. With Nanelia's dead, the dragon is no longer being controlled. The Canari then call out to kill the dragon, but she has Francesca free it, letting it fly away instead to safety. Francesca then uses her vines to bury the sarcophagus deep into the ground. We cut back to the Red Wraith who is massacring the Canari. Venus and Sir Aaron are debating what should be done, but find the Professor is still here. He says that this is his fault, he just wanted to see what the weapons did, not create a monster. But he thinks he knows how to stop the Red Wraith. The sword is healing him. Separate him from the sword, and the effect should stop. Sir Aaron then rushes in, asking if Fenris has ever heard a story and how he stopped a darkspawn emissary in the deep roads. Vaya panics, running to where the battle is taking place, but it's too late. Sir Aaron allows himself to be stabbed, using the unique position to cut off Shiralis' arm, then falls off the edge of the castle, taking the sword with him. Shiralis looks down at where his arms once were, while Autumn knocks him to his knees. He grumbles out, friend, when Fenris approaches, but he stabs the Red Ray, saying that they haven't been friends in a while, if ever. We cut to the Professor rushing out of the secret passage, stealing a horse from our heroes, but before he is able to get away, he is confronted by Tractus. The bastard heir wants the idol or the sword, just something to get him back into the Venatori. When the Professor says that the idol belongs in a museum, Tractus threatens him, to which we get our first real look at the idol back in its true form. 
The professor hands it over, saying that he doesn't believe it does anything anymore, but Tractus doesn't care. And with that, they leave. The Canari confront Marius and Tessa, saying that their truce is over, and now the fortress belongs to them. They must collect their injured and leave. Marius notes that one of the horses is gone, but Tessa doesn't believe it will really matter. Autumn, Francesca, and Vaya surround Sir Aaron. He is alive, but not for long. He is apologetic to Vaya for her having to take a life and wishes that it's never easy for her. But he tells her of a letter in his pocket, a letter to King Alistair to request that she be made a knight. Vaya protests that she is an elf, but he believes that he would do it, as the king is a good man. His final words are asking Vaya if she has heard another one of his stories, and she kisses him on the forehead goodbye, Francesca holding her as she sobs. Fenris suggests wrapping the remains of the Red Lyrium sword carefully to bring back to the Inquisition, but Vaya insists that she will be taking Sir Aaron back to Portsmouth to be fit with his family first. Francesca, Autumn, and Fenris agree to go with her. As they load up his body, Francesca asks if she would be able to take his horse, Casse, and Vaya thinks that he would have liked that. She then begins to tell Francesca the story of how he had obtained the horse. And finally, our comics end the way this whole journey started, with Marius and Tessa. She notes that she will miss them and that the group did well, but Marius counters that they just got lucky. Tessa, I then assume it's kind of vague, then runs down the list of all that they had accomplished and notes that they only had one casualty, so she believes they did do well. However, while they are talking, we see a mysterious hand look upon an alluvian, watching Tactus walk away from the idol, and we see that Solus has been watching the entire time. Talking points. Nothing too exciting, I just want to point out where our heroes start in this comic, which is around Neromenian, which I still feel like should actually be called Neromenia, but that's neither here or there, I guess. Anyway, you can kind of see the path that has been taken both by the group and the Canari, who pretty much take a back seat in this comic, but are still a pretty large threat. And I would also assume that Virantium, which is kind of in this line that they're going on, should be sweating at this point. From the very first issue of Knight Errant, we have heard that Sir Aaron was haunted by what he saw at Ostagar. And in this issue, we finally get to figure out what it was that haunted him. And that main horror being that his choices didn't matter. He didn't matter. I don't really have too much to say, other than I actually really liked this, and I also feel it's kind of like a bit of a meta-narrative decision, given that this is a tie-in to a role-playing game, which commonly the genre has complaints thrown at it that the choices don't end up mattering, so it's kind of... I... fitting? I, I actually really liked it. To begin, early on Tractus is called a Half-Blood. Some have speculated that this means his mother was an elf, which honestly is where my mind went as well. The writers would get a question about this on their Tumblr, and it turns out the answer is kind of up in the air. They explained that their thinking was that he was called a half-blood as his mother wasn't a mage, but they sort of liked the idea of him being half-elf as well, but it all really depends if they really get to write him again. Which, let's talk about Tractus's fate. Now, in Tevinter Nights, during the story Dread Will Take You, there is a story of a mage coming from House Daenerys to perform a ritual with the idol. The name of this mage is never told in the story, and this mage talks about how their master met some misfortune. This mage would later die, nommed by good old Solus himself, and no, I will not explain that for those who have not read the story. Now, the problem you might see is that this could either be Tractus or someone else. While I think it would make the most sense for Tractus to be this mage, and a fitting end for a guy trying to impress the Venatori, what we have here is a loose end that could be the jumping off point for some other series, and this could actually be just some random asshole. Maybe he has a brother, I don't... I don't know. I, I wish it is Tractus, though, I'll be honest. There was one line from the professor that I feel like I should explain, as on my first read-through I misunderstood. Now, when our villains are talking about the sword used for the ritual, the professor explains that the Red Lyrium Sword should survive the process, unlike the Lyrium Swords of the Arcane Warriors. I don't really know why I thought this, but at a first read-through, I thought that this was hinting that this is how you actually make Arcane Warriors, and Fenris is like, ye old Arcane Warrior or something. But, uh, what I had forgotten was that in Dragon Age Origin, there is a unique sword that can only be used by those with the Arcane Warrior specialization, called Spellweaver. The item description talks about how it can only be used by a maid, and that it was made using a lost technique that infuses the blade with lyrium. So that's what he's probably referring to. This is just a fun little moment that I wanted to point out, but in the later half of these comics, Veya is always willing to listen to Sir Aaron's stories, but when Fenris begins to tell one of his own, which by the way is actually like a real story you can play in Dragon Age 2, she doesn't give a shit. <laughs> I just 
really liked this character moment as it, as it shows that Thaya isn't really one for stories, but she does like to humor Sir Aaron. Not that this matters that much, but the horse that went missing was Francesca's, which is what she had just gotten from that big-headed dude from Blue Wraith. Uh, it's a Clydesdale. That's, like, literally the only horse breed I know. Thanks, childhood friend that was really into horses growing up. The death of Sir Aaron, while sad, I actually think is a fitting end to the character. He saved his companions and even got to tell one last story in the end. In a weird way, I also want to believe that this death, while tragic, was somewhat healing for Vaya. This is the first death of a loved one that she has witnessed that has been voluntary. He went in knowing exactly what was going to happen, did it successfully, and then even got to say goodbye. And in the end, he was more worried about Vea having to take a life than his own ending. Unlike the rest of her family, he died at peace knowing that there was a brighter future ahead. I also really love that the plot point that he had a letter ready to make her a knight. This was likely something that he had for a while and just didn't tell her about. Honestly, if we don't get at least a little codex talking about Ferelden's first elven knight, I'm gonna be like, pissed. <laughs> I want it to happen. It can happen. Now, if you have watched me long enough, you know how bothered I am by extended media burying the dead in the ground. So, when Vea starts talking about a funeral, I'm sure you were all prepared for me to go fucking bonkers. But, she never actually says that they will bury the body, and later on in their Tumblr blog, the writers confirm that they intended the funeral to be for his ashes, and that Vaya wishes for his body to be burned in his hometown. I, I kind of assumed that when I read the scene. I, I, I don't know what gave me that impression, because it's not like they tell it outright. Maybe at this point, like, I've just trusted them to actually give a shit about the lore and I just assumed that was correct and it ended up being that way uh but yeah that like that that scene didn't actually bother me I didn't even think about it now that being said I kind of disagree with Vaya here Aaron was just killed by a red lyrium sword and we have no idea what this stuff can do like if I were her I would be too paranoid that it would turn him into something awful so like I would have voted for a bonfire like right there on the beach but I mean that's just me uh, I'm sure nothing will go wrong because that would be absolutely horrific, but like, it, it, kind of an interesting story if like suddenly he turned into like a red lyrium corpse. Don't do it, please. I, I know, Nunzio and Christina, please, I know you watch these videos. Don't do that, please. <laughs> I don't, I don't want to see that. <laughs> In the very last page, we get Solus watching Tractus carry the idol from an alluvian. Honestly, this isn't something I'm surprised about, but this is also a bit monumental from a lore standpoint. What we have here is the first instance of an Alluvian being used as a watching device rather than a portal. Now, in previous games, it was said that Tevinters believe Alluvians used to be used for something like this, but until this point, we just thought that they were really wrong. And now we have proof that Tevinters weren't wrong, but they just didn't have the full story. So now we look like the assholes. Further, what I find interesting is that what he's doing actually kind of looks a lot like what Flemeth was doing at the end of Dragon Age Inquisition. Perhaps instead of putting something into the Illuvian, she was actually watching something? And if so, what was it? And you might be saying like, well, we couldn't see anything from the Illuvian from our perspective in the game, but like, in this far out shot from Solus, we can't see him looking at Tractus either. If you remember my last comic review on Blue Wraith, there was a small snippet from a podcast called Deconstructing Comics. Well, the writers Christina Weir and Nunzio de Philippus came back on the show to talk about this run, and a few things were brought up that I wanted to talk about. Links below if you want to hear it yourself, which I actually recommend you do. In the previous chat, we heard that um, Dragon Age fans are particularly passionate. Like they, and I think they look at your comics because we're still waiting for... Uh, news of when the fourth game is coming out. So they were looking to your comics for some sort of signs of where yep. the story is going. And uh, I, I mentioned this uh, YouTube channel that I follow. I, I said podcast, but it's a YouTube channel uh, called Guild Derton um, by Katie. And I uh, then saw that she did a video and she actually segmented a sequence, that piece of <laughs> our conversation in the video. <laughs> Uh, this isn't really what I wanted to talk about. I just wanted to say hi, because I'm assuming, uh, Emmett, you're watching. <laughs> hi. 
I feel so. I was just listening to this, minding my own business, and then you guys mentioned me, and like that really threw me for a loop. I'll be honest, I was not expecting that. So, hello. Hope you're doing well. But uh, anyway, back to my tea leaves. Now, something that I had in the back of my mind, but never really had proof of, was actually confirmed in this episode. The story that Knight Errant and even parts of Deception were setting up had to be redone. This is why, in their words, Calyx had to go in Blue Wraith, because in this new script, he just didn't have anything to do in Dark Fortress. Now, I'm actually going to be talking about this more later in the video, but for now, I kind of have a feeling that a lot of my issues with this run of comics don't stem from the creators of the comic, but actually Bioware. What I do want to focus on is this clip right here, and it's a bit long, so I'm going to edit it down a bit, so make sure to listen to the full interview. And when it came time to sit down and figure out the backstory of Fenris, we introduced the sarcophagus and the Bioware team were like, that's great. And it doesn't quite mesh with what's in the world of Theta's book, but what's in the world of Theta's book, if you tried to put that as a ticking clock at the end of a, a chase scene, you couldn't do it in the same way. Like, like these stories are about someone using that sarcophagus. So the fact that the world of Theta's book says, it takes weeks. It's like, oh, okay. Well, the ritual's going to start. That takes weeks. Let's stop and have some lunch. We don't need to hurry to stop it. You know, like so, we had to create something that would move a little faster. Um, and so we were changing the lore a little bit, and they loved it. And their response was, "All right, let's figure out who designed this, who built this, and therefore which society's style the sarcophagus would be." Like they jumped into it, and then they sort of near as I can tell, bent the lore a little bit to fit what we were doing. Mm -hmm. And now it's part of the world lore. Now, I don't think they're necessarily going to use the sarcophagus in Dragon Age 4. I, we've seen no indication that they would do that. Mm -hmm. But it wouldn't surprise me if they did because of the way they sort of jumped in and started getting excited about the idea. Uh, you mentioned before that you had all these art assets from the mm -hmm. studio as well, like just to give you a frame of reference for what this place is. And I think that's interesting as well. There's a very fixed idea of what's going on in this world, but there still seems to be a degree of flexibility. Yeah, they, is... like I said, they, they they were flexible with the sarcophagus, but at the same time, they went, all right, well, the sarcophagus, uh, like we had conversations about who built it. Hmm. And a little less so, but with the implication of to what end. Yeah. And so they started sending design work from multiple games from the society in question and said, can you design to, said to, and said to Fernando, can you design this sarcophagus so it fits with all of the rest of this? Yeah. Um, and so sometimes they are looking at assets and saying, what can we, we put this in here, what can we make this mean? And sometimes they're looking and saying, let's create something entirely new, but let's make sure it is, of the same patterns that we've been seeing. And so they're really good about trying to keep their world coherent and, and consistent so that people looking for clues might accidentally stumble upon the truth. I don't think they're scared of that. I find this fascinating on a ton of levels here. And honestly, I'm not even sure where to begin. I believe it was Ash who first pointed out that the sarcophagus had the same design elements as our new friend Moonhead, which like Moonhead has come up in way more videos than I would have thought. And I'm so sorry for all of you that have to listen to me explain this again, but to really boil it down, Comset art of the shadowy figure in the new trailer mural show this creature with a moon-like head. And from previous concept art, I have a sneaking suspicion that it could be the true form of an old God. Um, even though there's a lot of elven connections and we're all just really confused. Moving on, there are a lot of connections I can make with this sarcophagus, but while I have a ton of pieces of this puzzle, I can't form any answers. And the best thing I can really give here is just all of the pieces and then asking what you guys think this makes. So like I said, the crown thing is the shape of that moon-headed figure, along with the strange arms that kind of like look like little bug thingies. I, little, little, what are... What, what are the bug arms called? Is there like a name for those bunny little fuckers? I don't, I don't know. 
It also is thematically similar to what the fandom has referred to as the Templar cave painting that is seen around Inquisition, and the three circles on the crown that can only actually be seen in some parts of the comic is somewhat mirrored in Elven Temples and Inquisition as well. I think you can also draw similarities to the face mask and the one seen on various Mythal statues, and the actual purpose does seem to create a sort of Valislin that also adds magical powers to the wearer, which I, I could kind of see that being like a June thing, because like the Fenrises kind of look like June. I don't know. I actually have a video on Fenris and Valisling that I made like years ago, and like surprising that's been still relevant, so. I guess this whole video pulling up here, I actually haven't watched it in years. I have no idea what I say. <laughs> now, I do find the differences between what Lyrium and Red Lyrium does to be interesting. Fenris is able to phase through things, sometimes not by his own will, while Shialis never did anything like that. Fenris's markings are even and controlled, but Shiralis's looks very similar to burns that people receive when hit by lightning, which uh, perhaps a coincidence with the concept art of Moonhead. Maybe another connection? I don't know. Fenris was also able to keep his personality while Shiralis seemed to mostly be absent and only able to say a few words. Like, you could tell there was some memory there, but nothing, like, drastic. <laughs> this is all obviously the differences in the types of Lyrium, but it's interesting to see those differences made visual. Lyrium, while it does have its randomness, is controlled and refined, subtle, while Red Lyrium is overpowering, uncontrollable, and monstrous. Which, I think there's also an argument that the dragon fire used in the ritual could have added some of the wild side, but the writers did admit on the podcast that the artist wanted to draw something in the issue and they wrote it into a ritual and I'm just like assuming it's the dragon because who doesn't love to draw dragons? Like, come on. Did, look, at the, look at this panel and tell me the artist didn't have fun doing this. Now the writers are active on Tumblr and do like answering questions. Uh, like there was one about how Autumn is seven years old and I just, I don't know, that kind of melted my heart because Jinx turned seven this year and I was like, oh, they're the same age, puppies. Okay, anyway, but there was a question they had answered that I just wanted to highlight. Friend of the show, Felisan, asked about Shiralis and his backstory. First, the name is supposed to mean the Traveler, and that was actually more in line with the original draft of the character, who I believe we actually saw a hint of way back when sporting the June Valislin. Second, that while they never made it official, they liked the idea that he would have been adopted by the Oran Navara clan after his was destroyed. Now that name might sound familiar, as it was the clan that was attacked by Tevinter and then hired a crow as vengeance, as described in Tevinter Knights. The whole story. As this is the last chapter of the new Dragon Age comics, and as of now there are no more planned or announced, I just want to kind of sit here and discuss the series as a whole. First off, it sort of needs a better name than the new comics, because it will eventually not be the new comics anymore. I asked Twitter what everyone thought, and it seems that the fandom has settled on post-Inquisition comics. Now, while I have my own issues with this, sometimes you just need to go with what the collective thinks as it just makes it easier to talk about things. However, Nunzio jumped into the discussion to throw in the suggestion Knights Errant, which actually, I like it, I do, I just... It, everyone was saying post-Inquisition. Can I also suggest post-Inquisition? It just, we, we just rolls off the tongue. I'm also super curious about what the internal name for Deception Blue Wraith slash Dark Fortress is. I want to say it likely has something to do with Sarcophagus or the Idol, and please, if you're ever able to say it, please like tag me, because I really, really want to know what it is. I don't even care how many years it's been. Just pew, throw it at me. So I actually reread the entire Postquisition comics for this video, which is sort of why this is coming out so late, and I have a lot of thoughts. First is just... What happened with Mage Killer? There are actually a lot of strong elements to Mage Killer that the rest of the series doesn't step up to, mainly because Mage Killer was given time to just kind of build things up. But despite that, more happens in one issue of Dark Fortress than the entire run of Mage Killer. Mage Killer feels like what happens when you're given two interesting characters and then have nothing to do with them. And to be fair to his writer, I'm not sure if he was allowed to have a plot bigger than these two characters need to get out of Tevinter and then open up the passage in Inquisition. Now, Deception, which I was also highly critical of, has a similar issue, but in the opposite direction. 
It had a good plot base, but then the two characters I focus on, Olivia and Calix, weren't that interesting at face value, and then weren't given the time to develop as needed. And let's talk about deception for a bit. I think that Bioware sort of screwed over Nunzio and Christina. Or maybe it was EA, although kind of indirectly. I, I don't actually know who originally, uh, spoilers, canned Dragon Age 4. See, let's check out the release dates of this entire run of comics. Mage Killer and Knight Errant were released prior to October 2017, and Deception came out in October 2018. Now why do I care about October 2017? Well, we have no hard facts, but that's the theorized date of when Dragon Age 4 was rebooted and its story was scrapped into whatever we will be getting eventually whenever the game is actually released hopefully soon, god please. My theory is that Bioware had to call up the writers and change the direction of their story. Because it only took a year to its release, it's likely they reused all that they could and the story suffered for it. All of the other comics have a degree of polish and storytelling that is just lacking in deception to the point that I just can't believe that this was on purpose. Another thing that I'm going to be critical on Bioware about is actually to Venter Knights. Look, don't get me wrong, Dread Will Take You is an amazing story, but man did it suck the wind out of a lot of our sails when waiting for the series to continue. A lot of us thought that the sword to be used would have been the idol itself, and I do think that a lot of mystery would have been added if you go into Dark Fortress believing to see the idol sword, not seeing it used in a ritual, and then seeing it in full being carried out by Tractus, who was overlooked by Solus. And then if you actually read the Solus story after that, it would have just been a lot better. But because of Defender Knights, we already know Tractus loses it, and that Solus has been watching the entire time, and even more details on the idol than what we have in the comics. Minus the sarcophagus, the one deep lore addition that the series had to offer was taken away with the release of Tevinter Knights. And because of this, I want to say that the Postquisition comics in Tevinter Knights now break my easy to remember rule for Dragon Age tie in media consume in the order of release date. For this, I think you really should finish all the Postquisition comics before touching Tevinter Knights. Anyway, back to the series as a whole. My biggest complaint for this entire run, minus Mage Killer, was that it felt rushed. I really do think that this shouldn't have been limited to three issues in arc. We needed that five, maybe even more. However, Blue Wraith and Dark Fortress was able to balance a dramatic story and a touching character story as well. I just wish it had a little bit more breathing room. And even then, I still think it did a good job. An open letter. So, I'm on the record of being, I'm going to use the word weird, about the creators and devs of the world of Dragon Age seeing my videos, because frankly, I feel awkward. I want to be, and am, honest with my opinions in Dragon Age, and how I word that criticism is going to be different when I'm trying to entertain, versus actually talking to the creators. This hasn't been an issue for the most part, as I'm just some chuckle fuck on the internet, but in the past few years... And Newton's you and Christina broke down that barrier. I see you in my Twitter notifications. I know you know me. So, hey, just, I want to ignore the audience for a bit. And I'm just actually going to talk to you two for a bit because this might be the last chance I get. Thank you. I mean it. You two talk about being fans of Dragon Age, and I can feel that in these comics. We have seen what happens when someone doesn't give a damn, and it's rough. But you two, Greg, Fernando, and the rest of the team that created this have given the fans something to think about in the long wait between games, and this run has been great. Honestly, it has. I have my criticisms for Mage Killer and Deception, but it, it is actually decent. You know, I just, it could have been better, and that frustrates me. And I think you understand that, at least I hope you do. But I've had a lot of fun looking forward to these issues and then discussing them at length, and I know I'm not the only one who thinks that. And as this is the final issue that is planned at the moment, I want to express that I really do hope that there is more in the future that you guys get to, to create. And while I would love a cameo in the games, I actually think best case scenario would just be giving you guys a sizable issue run of, like, Knight Veya and Francesca and Autumn traveling and kicking some ass. So, I speak for the fandom here, but thanks for keeping us sane all these years, and I really hope that this isn't goodbye. And that, dear patrons, is all that we know on the last of the Dragon Age Postquisition comics. I'm going to force Postquisition because it's just easier for me to say. 
Do you still have lingering questions, proof that I'm wrong, comments about your own fan theory? Feel free to tweet me at Echo on Twitter or send a PM to user Gillanon on Reddit. The rest are all. <laughs>